So now we move on to uh, our second part of uh, the morning and we're going to uh, have some presentations on a topic called a democratically elected mayor. A view from the business community and it's a great privilege this morning that we have from the Dublin Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Avrik McGibney, Director of Public and International Affairs and also from Chambers Ireland, Mr. Shane Keneally, Director of Policy and Communications. So please give a warm Dublin City Assembly for our first presenter, Mr. Avrik McGibney. Okay, hi, good morning everyone. Uh, Averick is my name, um, Averick McGibney. I, uh, my name comes from um, a 1960s version of the Children of Lear and I turned swans into princesses. Um, that worked pretty well in my 20s, it probably doesn't work as well. <laughs> now, um, I was born in St. Michael's in Dunleary. Uh, my parents are both from Inchy Cor. Uh, my dad now lives in Lucan. Um, I now live in, you know, you kind of buy where you think you might. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live near where you kind of grow up, so I live near the Slorgan Shopping Centre, which I remember uh, fondly as a child. Um, and that's my life. It's all over Dublin, you know. Uh, I, I work in the city centre, um, uh, but, you know, my dad lives in one place. I live in somewhere else. So, you know, I think businesses also have a similar perspective about Dublin. You don't set up a shop saying, oh, I'm only going to sell to the people, you know, on the street outside. Uh, otherwise, there wouldn't be a Kilkenny design in the, you know, Salorgan Shopping Centre as well as the city centre. You don't set up a business thinking, well, I'll only hire people who live a kilometre away, you know, in terms of where you're going to get your skilled staff. So businesses also think about Dublin um, as a unit, if you like. I'm going to offer you um, some perspectives on Dublin because um, uh, I, uh, I was hoping to have a more fully formed discussion. We're still having a debate internally within Dublin Chamber about you know, our final thoughts, and we will hopefully make a submission in the next few weeks. But Art got me in. He, he, he got me ahead of time. So I'm going to offer you some thoughts and some perspectives, if that's OK. All right? Um, first up, just a little bit about what Chambers do, I suppose, just to kind of give you an idea. Uh, Dublin Chamber was founded in 1783. It's one of the oldest chambers in the world. Um, we have 1,300 member companies, which employ uh, themselves about 300,000 staff. And the breakdown of that membership is across the county of Dublin, pretty much reflecting the breakdown of commercial rates in the four local authorities, which I'll come to later. So my current president, for example, is the head of Dublin Airport. My last one was, uh, uh, they're elected every year. They're kind of the governor or the chief, the, the, the president for a year. Um, is from the city centre. The, she's the head of business banking in AIB. The previous person uh, was out in Sandyford. So again, you know, from all over Dublin. Okay, um, we're brought together. I mean, the reason people join Dublin Chamber is they we have a, a shared vision for Dublin to be sustainable, to be uh, have good quality of life, and to be uh, uh, known for its economic vibrancy. So these are these are the criteria that drag us together. I put up a slide there, or a graphic of, um, we asked about uh, 10 to 15,000 people, citizens of Dublin, what they thought of Dublin. Um, and I'll send that on actually to Art, just to give you an idea. It's a bit old now, it's from 2016, 2017, but it gives you some perspective about what people thought they would like Dublin to be in 2050, um, which is kind of maybe some information. Um, uh, and it's, it's from, as I say, an unbiased, it's a random sample of, of uh, people. So what does the Chamber actually do? Uh, we help companies export. We provide business matching services. So if you want to go to Poland to export, we'll find you somebody in Poland who can talk to you about doing that. We do export documentation, uh, which is uh, the pieces of paper you need to bring something abroad. Uh, we do a lot of networking and events, which companies meet and kind of get together, a bit like you guys, and get to know each other and do business. We do a lot of training and kind of knowledge-based events, so we have people speaking about, for example, this is how I ran my business, this is how I grew it, to inspire people, those kinds of things. And we also do uh, uh, lobbying, which is the, the dirty word in the room, but uh, it's very much usually about, because a city doesn't function without it being, um, without it working, a lot of that lobbying is about long-run transport infrastructure for the city, 
about having enough water, because we don't want any more water shortages, so we have to uh, take water from the Shannon in order to do that. So that'll be interesting. Uh, and about, say, energy as an issue. And the key issue, because they all join together, is about affordable housing. So that's, that's the main lobbying points that the Chamber uh, talks about. Um, so what's Dublin? Well, um, that's interesting. So Dublin was divided as a county into four administrative areas. I think because it got too big, and that's, that's a recurring theme. But I know, Jim, they didn't divide up um, Dublin in any other way, for example, in terms of uh, GAA, for example. Interestingly, when COVID was around, after the two kilometre bit, we all remember the two kilometres and the five, and you know, how, it was a county of Dublin that became the area you could move around. Um, so I nearly broke that trying to get out to buy a Christmas tree because I nearly went across the border into Wicklow, but you kind of forget, but it was the county of Dublin because how could you divide, you know, when does it become Lucan and then it becomes, you know, outside of Lucan into somewhere else? Um, there is a metropolitan area strategic plan for most of Dublin, and it's all about integrated transport and land use, which is a key function because basically cities are about where people live, where they go to do things, like recreation and go to school and stuff, and where they go to work. So those key functions are really, really important. So that already exists, but it's in a, another structure that we, we might come to. Um, and yet, um, you know, the recent collaboration between Dublin City Council and South Dublin is for a great, it's a great new idea, a brownfield site to convert to residential, but it's a stone's throw from uh, Blue Bell where my dad used to cycle into the city centre, and it's called City's Edge, which kind of gives you an idea sometimes of the thinking. The City's Edge isn't Blue Bell, you know? It's not even the Red Cow, you know? Um, so when businesses talk about Dublin, they talk about, I'm going to say, the functional area of the city. Um, so if you're in Dunleary right down, you do need to worry about Dublin Airport, because that's where you fly out of, you're going on holidays, but it's also the connection from a business point of view to your markets and things like that. And you worry about the port for similar reasons. And you think about Dublin in terms of three, if not four, universities with TU Dublin, for example. And you probably might include Maynooth as well, because they're all a source of people who might be trained graduates that you'd want to work. So you think about Dublin definitely as a county, and if not, probably even something even a bit bigger. So we think about the functional area of the city. Now, now, I'm an economist by trade, so I'm going to give you some stats, and this is, all of these will make some sense at the end, so I just ask you to bear with me. But Dublin, if anything, Dublin is small by international standards. Dublin barely makes the rankings sometimes when you look at OECD or other city rankings. And yet, it's a huge part of Ireland. So Dublin isn't a particularly big city internationally. It's not a particularly big capital city. But... Ireland, it's either Dublin is too big for Ireland or Ireland is too small for Dublin, but it's, it's just a huge part. Um, and uh, sorry, I skipped ahead of my slides. Um, so the latest census has it at 1.4 million people, but uh, the figures I have are, are, I didn't get a chance to update them. But it's pretty much nearly half of all the urban population of Ireland, okay? Employment is recorded by where people live, not by where they work, right? So you have 768,000 people that are reported um, according to the CSO figures. The CSO then asks them, well, where do you go to work? And that's 905,000 people. So 905,000 people work in Dublin, okay? Even though they could be in Kildare, they could be in Nace, they could be in Bray, they could be wherever. 40% of all gross value added, which for you and me is GDP. So 40% of all the stuff that's made, produced and done is from Dublin. Half of all tax revenue, nearly two-thirds of all corporate tax revenue, and corporate tax revenue is half, a quarter of all exchequer revenue these days because of very high corporation tax receipts. So there's a lot of money in Dublin, right? And we'd love to get our hands on all of that. Wouldn't it be great? Um, so as I say, Dublin's pretty big. Um, most of my arguments are going to be around and what the Chamber would have been arguing would have been about aggregation, not devolution, okay? So... There is another process that uh, you've seen Tim talking about, which is about county level or local authority level devolution. It tends to be a debate about a chief executive having powers and a mayor having powers, the responsibility between the two. And you've seen what's going on with Limerick, basically. And I imagine what will happen in Limerick is something that will be replicated in other counties if they choose to have an election for a directly elected mayor. But we've, we've long form in this. Um, I think of, for example, uh, when uh, Minister Gormley was looking to introduce the idea of a directly elected mayor, 
but the powers were very, very light if you look back at the legislation. They were about sort of moral suasion, if anything else. So in other words, we'll set up a figure, but they won't be able to do very much. They'll just be somebody who, by their election, will actually be important. Um, so um, most of the argument is about increased aggregation, if you like. Um, we notice, um, if you look at the trend of what's happening in terms of local authorities and the powers and the relationship between national government, if anything, there's a, an increasing trend towards aggregation of powers, powers going from local to national or regional rather than the other way around. Okay? So uh, we nearly had a Dublin Transport Authority to deal with all the transport of Dublin. It's got most of the buses and all that other stuff. But the last minute it was trained into a National Transport Authority that's a special, specific remit for Dublin. Um, you've seen water going from local authorities to a national body. You've seen planning going. Now there's a hierarchy. The Minister for Housing sets things then that have to be obeyed by regional authorities that have to be obeyed down um, to local authorities. So there's a hierarchy all the way through. Um, there's a planning regulator, again, also, that if, if, if a local authority says we're going to zone it one way, but it's not in the national interest, the, the planning regulator will come in. Also, for example, we've seen trends in terms of um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, taxation, for example. Uh, there's a vacant site levy, so if there's underutilized land, somebody should be taxing it to make sure it's utilized if it's not being used. That power has gone to revenue, which we just heard, of course, there's death and taxes, but there's, there's death and revenue, really, I think, in terms of uh, who's got the power. Um, so uh, there's, an there's a trend towards this. It's, I think I observe there is a trend towards this, particularly when we're talking about devolution. The last 10 years shows you otherwise, okay? Um, uh, I've little to say on the structure, I really do, because business people aren't really experts on structure. Usually the argument for a mayor was about setting somebody on top to drive efficiencies between the four local authorities. So you have four payroll systems, four IT systems, can we have it better? Not to take away the power at local level, but to save money, and, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, uh, and I put up here the powers that uh, Limerick have proposed in their proposal. So that's the bit that's going through um, this debate about whether, you know, it'll, it'll chasing the legislation. Um, a lot of it is about carving out a seat at the table and having representation into national government, really. It's about saying, make somebody important enough in Limerick that they'll get a chance to talk about the big issues, the health, education, housing, things like that. That's, that's what I read into that. I'll leave the slides, obviously, they'll, they'll be available to you afterwards when I'm rushing through this. Um, and in many ways, there's an argument for this. There are 45 Dublin TDs, um, but they don't really behave in many ways as a unit. There's much smaller cities that do much better where there's a smaller number of TDs, but they argue for the region a lot better. 45 TDs argue for 45 different regions and constituencies within Dublin. So Dublin is very divided. So always chase the money. I'm racing towards the end here. Sorry, I'm conscious of time. Um, this is the level of commercial rates funding in value terms and as a percentage of total funding uh, for the four local authorities in Dublin. Um, Dublin City Council, despite the number being quite big, it's a smaller ratio because there's a lot more money in, money out stuff we just heard, a lot of intergovernmental transfers that are earmarked for particular things. But in general, businesses um, in commercial rates alone fund a good half of all local government and they've no idea where that money is spent. Nobody comes back and says, here, this is where it goes. Uh, the big fear for many businesses would be, it'll be another tax, a hotel bed tax, let's add more taxes. Let's make, businesses don't vote, so it'd be great if we had more taxes on business. That's, that's what they worry about when you talk about having local funding. Collection, as we've seen, seems to go to revenue because they're very good at it and they know where you live and they'll get you when you die. Um, and, you know, these are, well, to debate it with me, but there's a, um, you know, the, the, the worry from a local uh, business point of view is, you, you know, be looking for a hotel bed tax. That's, that's the simple version, or something else. This is just another survey, you can't read it, and that's deliberate. It's a survey we did of what Dublin's reputation is abroad. Um, and in it, then, we asked people who live in Ireland, who weren't born in Ireland. I call them New Irish. We've got non-national, I don't know the right word anymore, but I think there's one in five people who live in Dublin weren't born in Dublin. 
And there's all happy stuff and great stuff about what they want, and they think Dublin is great. Interestingly, they wear, obviously, they live here about its great diversity. Um, in every sense of the word, watching the, the Pride uh, yesterday. And the thing they're all worried about are the bit in the bottom, which is all about the infrastructure and the housing, and it's pretty poor at lots of those things. So I make the point, um, sometimes we put all our problems and our challenges in and saying, God, it's about housing, it's about this and that. And we say, what role would solve all of this? I'm not sure, you know, it's, we need to think very carefully about what person, what role can solve all these problems. And maybe be careful about how much you wish for in terms of, not how much you wish for, but how much you think these might be solved by the person you're talking about. So in conclusion then, um, no one is in charge of Dublin at the moment, right? There are four local authorities, they cooperate, um, uh, and no one's there to make sure that its deficits are, are addressed. So in some ways, it'd be super to see a Dublin, a directly elected Dublin mayor, uh, sitting on top of, or you know, in some other way, dealing and engaging with the county of Dublin, not to replace local democracy. And you know, there's a whole bunch of debates underneath that. But somebody needs to worry about the, the airport, where the housing is, where the transport is, and things like that. Um, so not necessarily to replace the existing local authorities, but that's a different debate. The argument I'm making here is about somebody needs to be responsible for Dublin. Um, so I don't do that. I'm not going to debate about that devolution piece. That's a, that's a separate decision and a separate debate, if you like, from, from my pr perspective. Um, I would very much caution against the introduction of something that's halfway. So I think whatever you do at the end of the day, if you don't get what you want, and you can write what you want in, in what you're going to propose, but be sure to put a clause in that don't do it in some halfway measure, because that's what happens when you enter into a negotiation. You end up somewhere in the middle, or not really at all, depending on where the power lies. I'd really suggest you put in a caveat about what that might be. Um, funding, I talked about fear of additional uh, 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 taxation on business. Challenges, I said Dublin's too big, or Ireland's too small. Um, you can have a debate about so much power will be given to, to a place that has two-thirds of all corporation tax revenue and half of all income tax, and whether you get to keep all of that. Um, so what we've said is, look, if you are going to elect a directly elected mayor, and you, what are the powers? There is actually a metropolitan area strategic plan for Dublin. At the moment, that's done on a regional level, which is even higher. It's the eastern region. Somebody could look at that and be in charge of transport and land use and some of the other powers that are discussed at that regional level. That would be an initial good point to start with. Uh, I've met every mayor in London from Ken Livingston on, except Boris. Boris doesn't leave London because he doesn't want to, uh, <laughs> doesn't want to leave the city. Um, and, you know, it started off small and got bigger. It started off with some powers and got bigger. Um, so it is, it is worth it to make that point. So transport and land use will be a good start, for example. Um, but um, if you don't get that, and if you don't believe that powers will be devolved at a local level, maybe think about what those powers should be and who should get them. There is a Minister for Rural Affairs at national level sitting at the Cabinet. Could there be a Minister for Dublin? Could there be a Minister for Urban Affairs? There are five cities set out in the national planning framework. Is that a better way to get what you want out of these powers? So not trying to replace local government and local democracy at a very local level in terms of those powers, but in terms of the row about how Dublin works and functions, um, my suggestion is a directly elected mayor dealing with transport and land use, um, but if not, maybe something at national level. Thank you.